Ole Shoinka based on a real incident that took place. Death and the King's Horseman is a play by Wole Shoinka based on a real incident that took place in Nigeria during the colonial era. The horseman of a Yoruba king was prevented from committing ritual suicide by the colonial authorities. In addition to the intervention of the colonial authorities, Shoinka calls the horseman's own conviction toward suicide into question, posing a problem that throws off the community's balance. Akinwande Oluwol Babatundi Shoinka Hun FRSL Yoruba Akinwande Oluwole Babatunde Soinka, born 13 July 1934, known as Wole Shoinka pronounced Vle Ojinka, is a Nigerian playwright, novelist, poet, and essayist in the English language. He was awarded the 1986 Nobel Prize in Literature, for, in a wide cultural perspective and with poetic overtones fashioning the drama of existence, the first sub-Saharan African to be honored in that category. Shoinka wrote the play in Cambridge, where he was a fellow at Churchill College during his political exile from Nigeria. He has also written a preface to the play, explaining what he sees as the greatest misconceptions in understanding it. In particular, he says that the play should not be considered as, clash of cultures. Rather, the play demonstrates the need for interaction between African and European cultures, as per Shoinka's post biafran cultural philosophy. Death and the King's Horseman builds upon the true story on which Shoinka based the play, to focus on the character of Ellison, the King's Horseman of the title. According to some Yoruba traditions, the death of the King must be followed by the ritual suicide of the King's Horseman as well as the King's dog and horse, because the Horseman's spirit is essential to helping the King's spirit ascend to the afterlife. Otherwise, the King's spirit will wander the earth and bring harm to his people. The first half of the play documents the process of this ritual, with the potent, life-loving figure Ellison living out his final day in celebration before the ritual process begins. At the last minute, the local colonial administrator, Simon Pilkings, intervenes, the suicide being viewed as illegal and unnecessary by the colonial authorities. In the play, the result for the community is catastrophic, as the breaking of the ritual means the disruption of the cosmic order of the universe and thus the well-being and future of the collectivity is in doubt. The community blames Ellison as much as Pilkings, accusing him of being too attached to the earth to fulfill his spiritual obligations. Events lead to tragedy when Ellison's son, Oland, who has returned to Nigeria from studying medicine in Europe, takes on the responsibility of his father and commits ritual suicide in his place so as to restore the honor of his family and the order of the universe. Consequently, Ellison kills himself, condemning his soul to a degraded existence in the next world. In addition, the dialogue of the native suggests that this may have been insufficient and that the world is now, adrift in the void. Another Nigerian playwright, Duro Ladipo, had already written a play in the Yoruba language based on this incident, called Obawaja The King is Dead. Anti-colonialism is considered a theme by some scholars based on aspects of the text, but Shoinka specifically calls the intervention by the colonial administrator, an incident, a catalytic incident merely, in the, author's note, prepended to the play. Citation needed. Yoruba Proverbs. Edit. Almost every character in Death and the King's Horseman at some point uses a traditional Yoruba proverb. Through his vast knowledge of Yoruba proverbs, Shoinka is able to endow his play with a strong Yoruba sentiment. Characters often employ Yoruba proverbs primarily as a means of bolstering their opinions and persuading others to take their point of view. 6. The praise singer gets annoyed with Ellison for his decision to take a new wife and tries to dissuade him. Because the man approaches a brand new bride he forgets the long faithful mother of his children. Ariawoko Ayal 6201 Similarly, Ayaloha tries to admonish Ellison against his earthly attachments and stay true to the ritual upon which the good of his society depended. Eating the awusa nut is not so difficult as drinking water afterwards. Atija Asala Awusa Ko to ATI Mu Omici 6201 Another common way in which Shoinka uses proverbs is with Ellison. Ellison himself uses several proverbs in order to convince his peers that he is going to comply with their ritual and thus join the ancestors in Oran. The kite makes for wide spaces and the wind creeps up behind its tail. Can the kite say less than thank you, the quicker the better. Awodi to o n r e abara, e f u f u ta na iti pa o ni eyes kuku ya. 6 202. The elephant trails no tethering rope, that king is not yet crowned who will peg an elephant. Ajanaku Kuro Nin, Mo Ri Nkan Furi, 
by a bari erin he and iri erin 6202. The river is never so high that the eyes of a fish are covered. Odu ki ikan bo eja laju 6202. The final way in which proverbs appear in the play is when Ialoha and the praise singer harass Ellison while he is imprisoned for failing to complete his role within the ritual. What we have no intention of eating should not be held up to the nose. Ohenti aki ija aki ifif run imu 6202. Wesade you were the hunter returning home in triumph, a slain buffalo pressing down on his neck. You said wait, I first must turn up this cricket hole with my toes. Aki I ru aran aran lori ki ama fes wa iron aisle 6202. The river which fills up before our eyes does not sweep us away in its flood. Odo tia toju eni kun ki igbi, nilo 6202. Performances. Written in five scenes, it is performed without interruption. Seventh Choyinka himself has directed important American productions, in Chicago in 1976 and at Lincoln Center in New York in 1987, but according to Andrew Gumbel, the play, has been much more widely admired than performed. 3. The British premiere was directed by Felita Lloyd at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester in 1990. It starred George Harris and Claire Benedict. 8. The play was performed at London's Royal National Theatre beginning in April 2009, directed by Rufus Norris, with choreography by Javier de Frutos and starring Lucian Masamati. 3. The play was also staged by The Saint. Louis Black Repertory Theatre February 2008, directed by Olushigan Ojuui, who has been dramaturge for the Oregon Shakespeare's production. It was performed at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival from February 14 to July 5, 2009, as well. 9. A Yoruba translation Iku Olakan Isan was also performed at the National Theatre, Lagos, Nigeria, directed by Olushigan Ojuui, thus making him the first and only director to have staged the play in both English and in Yoruba the language and culture of the play, citation needed. In 2021, it was performed on stage at Terra Culture, directed by Bolanli Austin Peters in collaboration with Mountain Foundation. 10. It starred Olorotomy Michael Fakunli as Ellison Oba and Mawuyan Ogun as Ayaloha. 11. In 2021, the Crane Creations Theatre Company had led a play date event of Death and the King's Horsemen. This monthly play reading is held by a group of professional theatre artists for the purpose of spreading an increasing appreciation of playwrights from around the world. It was included in the 2022 program of Canada's Stratford Festival, and directed by Tawia McCarthy. 12. Summary. Near the end of the day, Ellison, the King's Horseman, dances through the market. He's eager to reach the market and assures his praise singer that he just wants to be in the market among the women, where he's happy. The praise singer makes sure that Ellison still plans to die later. Ellison assures him that he's happy to die, but now, he wants the women to dress him in fine clothes and enjoy life. To show the praise singer how serious he is about dying, Ellison dances and chants the story of the not I bird. The not I bird goes around to all people, animals, and gods, telling them it's time to die. All the beings tell the bird they're not ready and hide away, but Ellison says that when the bird came for him, he told it he'd be right along. As Ellison tells this story, the women of the market, including Ayaloha, surround him and dance with him. He and the women perform a call and response chant in which he assures them that he's going to die. Ellison, the women, and the praise singer discuss how honorable Ellison is, but Ellison takes offense when the women praise him. They're not sure what they said wrong, but Ellison finally admits that he just wants them to dress him in fine clothes. Ellison catches sight of something in the distance, and the distraction, a beautiful young woman, walks into the market. The praise singer thinks that Ellison is going crazy when he begins to talk about possibly being dead already. They discuss Ellison's reputation as a ladies' man, and Ellison asks about who the woman was. Ayaloha hesitantly explains that the woman is already engaged. This annoys Ellison, but he persists and says that since it's his last day on earth, he should be allowed to marry her, conceive a child with her, and leave this as a parting gift. Though Ayaloha tries to convince Ellison that this is a bad idea, she finally gives in. Later that evening, at the district officer's house, Simon Pilkings and his wife, Jane, tango through their living room. They're dressed in Egungan costumes. The local sergeant, Amusa, arrives with news, but is distraught when he sees the Egungan. 
he refuses to look at Pilkings or tell him anything, which makes Pilkings very angry, especially since Amusa is a Muslim and, in Pilkings's understanding, shouldn't be upset about this. Finally, Pilkings tells Amusa to just write down his report. Amusa's report is disturbing. Ellison plans to commit death, which Amusa says is a criminal offense. Pilkings and Jane believe Ellison is going to murder someone, and Jane suggests they skip the costume ball later to deal with this disturbance. Pilkings decides to just arrest Ellison. They call for their houseboy, Joseph, who explains that Ellison is going to kill himself so he can accompany the king, who died a month ago, to the afterlife. Pilkings sighs. He has history with Ellison. He snuck Ellison's oldest son, Oland, out and sent him to England to train as a doctor four years ago, despite Ellison insisting that Oland needed to stay for some ritual. They reason that this is the ritual, and Jane realizes that Oland would be the next king's horseman. Joseph excuses himself when Pilkings calls the natives, devious bastards. Pilkings calls Joseph back to explain what the drumming is about, and is angry when Joseph says he can't tell, it sounds both like a wedding and a death. Joseph leaves again and Jane declares that they need to stay home and deal with this. Pilkings sends Joseph to the police station with a note, tells Jane to put her costume back on, and shares that the prince is going to be at the ball, so they have to go. Back in the market, Amusa and his constables try to get through a group of women to enter a stall that's draped in rich cloth. The women insult Amusa for working for the English, mock his virility, and accuse him of trespassing. They refuse to let him any closer to Ellison and say that Ellison will prove himself more powerful than the white men by killing himself. Ayaloha arrives to mediate the situation, but joins the women in insulting Amusa. Several young girls take matters into their own hands. They steal the office's batons and hats, and then act out a scene in which they're Englishmen discussing the lying natives and the horrendous weather. This insults and embarrasses Amusa, but Ayaloha refuses to come to his defense. Finally, Amusa and his constables leave, the women dance and celebrate the girls as Ellison steps out of the stall. He has just had sex with his new wife, and says that the future lies with his child that the bride will bear. Ellison begins to listen to the drums, narrate what's happening, and dance toward death. The women dance with him as he says that the king's dog and horse are dying, and then the praise singer reminds Ellison of what he must do. Ellison sinks deeper and deeper into the trance and the praise singer tells Ellison that if those on the other side don't honor him properly, they'll welcome him back. At the ball, the band plays music to introduce the prince. The prince is taken with the Egungan costumes, but the resident soon pulls Pilkings outside to explain a note that arrived from Amusa about Ellison's suicide. The resident reminds Pilkings that he needs to be vigilant in order to support the empire, and when Amusa arrives, the resident asks if Amusa is part of the riot. Pilkings tries to get Amusa to give him his report, but Amusa again refuses to speak to him in the Egungan costume. Pilkings dismisses Amusa as the clock strikes midnight. He and Jane wonder if this is the moment that Ellison will kill himself, and Pilkings runs away. Oland, who has returned from England, finds Jane outside and asks for Pilkings. They discuss her costume and though Oland will look at her, he says she's still doing a disrespectful thing by wearing the Egungan. He explains that she doesn't understand why it's wrong because she's English. They discuss World War II, which is currently going on, and the ethics of killing oneself to save many others. Jane refuses to direct Olin to Pilkings, and is shocked when Olin says that he's here to bury Ellison and stop Pilkings from trying to stop Ellison from dying. He tries to make it clear that Ellison needs to die and is doing an honorable thing, but Jane won't have it. She becomes increasingly upset as Olin points out that thousands of Englishmen are dying in the war, something he suggests is mass suicide. Olin leads Jane outside to listen to the drums and notes the moment in which Ellison dies. Jane is disturbed by Olin's calm and attracts the attention of the aide-de-camp, but she sends him away. Olin tries to explain why he was so calm, but also attempts to excuse himself to go sit with his father's body. From offstage, Olin and Jane hear Pilkings telling someone to restrain people. Pilkings steps into sight and is shocked when Olin says that it would have been a tragedy had Pilkings succeeded in stopping Ellison. Pilkings refuses to let Olin go see his father and then speaks. With the aide-de-camp, he wants to know if he can put Ellison in the cellar where they used to keep slaves. As Pilkings marches away, Oland and Jane wonder what's causing so much commotion. Their question is answered when they hear Ellison, yelling angrily. Ellison races into view but stops when he sees Oland. He falls at Oland's feet, and Oland insults his father and walks away. 
In his cell, Ellison stands, his wrists chained, and looks at the moon. There are two guards in the cell with him, and his bride sits demurely outside. Pilkings tries to talk about how calm and peaceful the night is, but Ellison insists that the night isn't calm by any means, Pilkings has destroyed Ellison's life and the lives of others. They argue about whether Pilkings was just doing his duty or not. Ellison explains that he's not at risk of dying anymore, as he was supposed to die at a specific moment a while ago. He says that he doesn't blame Pilkings, even though he's ruined his life by stealing Oland and stopping Ellison from doing what he needs to do. Pilkings tries to comfort Ellison by saying that not everything is as bad as it seems, Olin thinks that this is salvageable. Ellison disagrees, but thinks that he no longer has any honor and cannot even call himself Olin's father. Pilkings leaves, and Ellison tells his bride that he blames her in part for his failure, as she showed him that there are things on earth that he still wants to enjoy, and he didn't want to die. Pilkings and Jane return and argue if Oland and Ioloha should be allowed to visit Ellison. Ellison assures Pilkings that nothing worse than what's already happened will come of Ioloha visiting. Pilkings shows Ioloha in and she immediately begins to berate Ellison. She says that he's dishonored himself and the world, and reminds him that she warned him this would happen. He tries to explain why he faltered, but she's unsympathetic. Ioloha says that she's coming with a burden. Pilkings tries to show Ioloha out, but she refuses to leave and says that Ellison must perform certain things. Their king will be upset in the afterlife, and he needs to let their king go. The aide de camp races in to say that there are women at the bottom of the hill. Since it's just women, the aide de camp agrees to let them into the cellar. They enter, carrying a cylindrical object on their shoulders that's covered in cloth. Ioloha says that it's the burden in the king's courier, and Ellison needs to whisper in the courier's ear so he can release the king. Pilkings refuses to let Ellison out. The praise singer reminds Ellison of what his duty was and says that someone else took Ellison's place. The women reveal that the cloth covers Olin's body, and the praise singer continues to tell Ellison how he has ruined things. Horrified, Ellison flings his chains around his neck and strangles himself. Pilkings tries to resuscitate him, but Ioloha tells him to stop. When he asks if this is what she wanted, Ioloha answers that this is what Pilkings gets when he doesn't respect the customs of others surrounding death. The bride closes Ellison's eyes and pours a bit of dirt over them, and Ioloha leads her away. Ioloha encourages the bride to think of her unborn child. Previous. Intro. As the market is closing up for the day, Ellison dances through it and sings, accompanied by drummers and his praise singer. The praise singer teases Ellison about racing too quickly toward the women in the market and forgetting the people who already know and love him, but Ellison insists that he loves the market and needs to be among the women there. Laughing, the praise singer points out that this is a special day for Ellison, and maybe he shouldn't be running for the women in the market. He asks if Ellison is certain that there will be someone as skilled as he is at singing Ellison's praises in the afterlife and says that if Ellison needs him to come too, he'll follow. Given the way that Ellison acts and dances so happily through the market, it's clear that he loves life and specifically, loves women in the market. Keep in mind that in the Yoruba belief system, the market is a metaphor for the center of the world. This shows that Ellison wants to be in the middle of the living world, and by extension, among the women who are there and who, biologically, are responsible for creating life. Themes Life and Death Theme Icon Women and Power Theme Icon Ellison assures the praise singer that he doesn't need him to accompany him to the afterlife, instead, the praise singer needs to remain in this world so he can sing about Ellison for those who are still alive. Ellison again praises the market, where the women dote on him and spoil him with fine fabrics and food. The praise singer warns Ellison that if he's not careful, the women might weaken his resolve to die, but Ellison says that he wants to die having danced with the women and smelled the smells of the marketplace. The conversation between Ellison and the praise singer tells the reader that Ellison is going to die later on in the play. This is Ellison's last hurrah, and because he loves life, women, and the market so much, he wants to spend his last hours there with them. The way he speaks about the women shows that he's a beloved figure to them as well. When the women tell Ellison that he's a man of honor, however, Ellison tells them to stop. The women worry that they offended Ellison, and Ellison confirms that he's extremely offended. Nervously, Ioloha asks for Ellison to forgive them and tell them what they did wrong. Ioloha and The women kneel and beg Ellison to correct them as Ellison asks if his body should be taken for a vagrant. The women are still baffled, and the praise singer tells Ellison to tell them what they need to do. 
Allison says that a man of honor shouldn't be wearing the clothes he's wearing, and he laughs. The women run to fetch rich clothing from their market stalls. Playing this joke on the women isn't especially nice, but it again establishes Allison as a beloved figure among the women at the market. They want to please him and make him happy, and it never occurs to them that Allison might actually be the one at fault here. This does show that Ellison, and men more broadly, have more power than women in terms of action in the play, while women must do what they can to keep men happy and satisfied. Themes. Women and power theme icon. The women dress Ellison in the rich clothing and again ask for forgiveness. Ellison insists that since he loves all the women so much, he has to forgive them for anything and everything. The women in Ialoha dance and sing that they feared that they'd upset the balance of the universe by offending Ellison on this great day. When Ellison is fully dressed, he stands surrounded by the dancing women. As he catches sight of something off stage, he says that the world is good. The women respond that they know he'll leave the world in a good place. Ellison says that he cannot disconnect himself from his roots, even though he can't actually see the navel of the world. Just as the women have a responsibility to make Ellison happy, Ellison understands that he must return the favor and make the women happy if he wants to keep the world in order. This begins to show that there's a symbiotic relationship between the men and women in Ellison's society, and everyone has a role to play in order to make the society function properly. Notice too that offending someone means upending the entire universe. This sets up the stakes for not behaving properly, it would be catastrophic. Themes Life and Death Theme Icon Women and Power Theme Icon Duty and Collective Responsibility Theme Icon the distraction that caught Ellison's eye, a beautiful young woman, walks into the market. Ellison says that the world is creating a fantastic farewell for him, unless he's already dead. He asks the surrounding women and the praise singer if he's still in the market, or if he's gone. The praise singer is concerned by these questions and assures Ellison that he's still the one speaking to him, not departed praise singers in heaven. Here, Ellison's musings about the bride show that women are powerful in ways not necessarily connected to their actions, the bride has the power, through her beauty, to make Ellison question if she's of a different world. Themes, Life and Death Theme Icon Women and Power Theme Icon Ellison points out that as the horseman of the king, he had access to any woman he wanted. He notes that people would say that if they hit a beautiful woman in a tree, he'd choose that tree to camp under. The praise singer says that Ellison certainly has a reputation. He reminisces about the time that they caught Ellison with his bride's sister, and Ellison insisted that he was honoring her like a grateful in-law. The praise singer praises Ellison's virility and reputation with the women, but Ellison stops him and asks who the young woman is whom he saw enter the market. By establishing Ellison's reputation as a ladies' man, the praise singer and Ellison continue to make it clear that Ellison's love of life is rooted primarily in his desire for carnal pleasures. Notice, however, that this isn't portrayed as a bad thing, even when Ellison does something that seems uncouth, like sleeping with his sister-in-law. Instead, it's what gives him a good reputation with women. Themes. Life and Death Theme Icon. Ellison describes how beautiful the young woman's body is and again asks who she is. Hesitantly, Ayaloha tries to speak. She agrees that Ellison is still alive and therefore able to notice beautiful women, but she says that the woman is already engaged. Annoyed, Ellison asks why Ayaloha had to share this information with him. Ayaloha says that this day belongs to Ellison, but suggests that Ellison should want to be remembered by what he leaves. Ellison agrees with this and says that it's only through memory that people can defeat death, but suggests that he'd like to travel light and leave behind something that will benefit all of those still living. The women tell Ellison he's honorable, and Ellison replies that since he's so honorable, he needs to marry this young woman. What Ellison is referring to, in a roundabout way, is that he'd like to have sex with the bride and conceive a child with her to leave behind after he dies. This suggests that this child would be one other way that the people still living could remember Ellison, alongside the memories of his honor. His annoyance when Ayaloha shares that the bride is engaged shows that while Ellison may talk the talk about doing what's right for his community, he also has a selfish streak and wants to get his way, regardless of the cost. Themes Life and Death Theme Icon Duty and Collective Responsibility Theme Icon Ayaloha points out that Ellison, in his honor, doesn't ruin other people's happiness for his own pleasure. Ellison, however, says that the women are trying to stop him from one final pleasure. He says he'd like to travel light by having sex with the young woman and allowing their child to stay behind. 
Ayaloha turns to the women and says that since Ellison is already so close to death, she can't refuse him. They remind Ayaloha that the bride is already engaged to Ayaloha's own son, but Ayaloha says she can't ruin Ellison's final day for him. In order to keep the world in order, she cannot let Ellison die with regrets. By leveraging the fact that Ellison is preparing to die for his people and do them a massive favor, his death will keep the cosmic order in line. Ellison is able to get Ayaloha to allow him to marry the bride. This shows that in addition to getting extra privileges just because he's the king's horseman, Ellison also gets special treatment because of the sacrificial service he's going to perform for his people. Themes. Life and death theme icon women and power theme icon duty and collective responsibility theme icon. Ellison asks if the women have come to a decision, and Ayaloha answers that they have. Ellison can have the young woman. She points out, however, that Ellison should take care to not leave a curse. This offends Ellison a little, and he becomes even more exasperated when Ayaloha says that they need to go prepare both his bridal chamber and his burial shrouds. He recovers and asks that his young bride perform the final rites after he dies. The women leave and return with the woman. When Ellison seems to startle at Ayaloha's mention of the burial shrouds, it suggests that he's actually not as keen on dying as he's previously pretended to be. He's far more interested in having sex with his bride than he is in dying, Something that, on a grander scale, suggests that Ellison is more interested in the pleasures of life than he is in an honorable death. Themes. 